from heaven to earth to show the way from the earth to the cross my day to day from the cross to the grave from the grave to the sky Lord I lift your name on high Lord I lift your name on high we sing out to you Lord we lift your name Oh 
the living creatures, Lord, speak and bless, praise, and joining at your throne, we'll sing their sweet refrain. The living creatures, Lord, speak and bless, praise, and joining at your throne.
in his closing moments just offer up ourselves to the Lord for the week just in a song or in a, in a prayer you can do what you will Lord for we love you here bring your kingdom for we love you here in the midst give you everything I'm going to start off with this uh, hand mic, but if I have a problem, I'll switch over onto this one here. I'm not very good on these things. It's more um, David Parker style. I think he, he might swing it around with greater effect. Or perhaps it's the other arm. That's the, my problem. I might swing it. I just want to say, before I introduce the real speaker tonight, I want to share with you a verse which has been very much to the fore in the whole time that God has... Uh, had me in uh, Chorley Wood, and which has come uh, to me with so much impact in these last few months. And it comes from, in the last few weeks, rather, well, it comes from Isaiah chapter 43, verse uh, 18, where the prophet says, Forget the former things, don't dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing, now it springs up, do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. He says, forget the former things uh, to the people of Israel that he's writing, that he's speaking to, and yet he's just reminded them of the incredible victory uh, of their uh, salvation from the Egyptians when the Lord rescued them and brought them across uh, the sea, the Red Sea. And in that situation, uh, there was a remarkable miracle. The sea divided, and the people of Israel crossed over, and then the sea came together again and swallowed up their enemies. Now he says, forget the former things. Does he mean really that Israel is to forget what God has done for them in the past? Does God mean, when we're looking for the new thing, that we are to forget what Jesus Christ has done for us on the cross? Never. He's given us his forget-me-not, uh, and we will never forget what Jesus 
has achieved and accomplished for us on the cross. And everything that will be happening this week is uh, towards that end to bring glory to Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, and there is no other. So, but what does he mean here when he says, forget the former things? I think what he's saying is, don't let what God has done in the past so uh, condition your mind that you think this is the only thing that God does. That, uh, that God can do other things beside that. And he is, of course, always doing other things for our blessing. And it's so possible to be so single-minded, to have a, 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 a fixed mindset, as it were, on what God does and what God has done, that we can't see what God is doing and what God is going to do. Now, in the past, here was the, de here was the sea, the Red Sea, and God drove a, a, a dry way through the middle of it. And so Israel were rescued. Now what he's saying is, I'm doing a new thing. Here is the dry desert, and God is putting a stream through the middle of it. It's a completely different thing that he's doing. In the, in the former case, it was a, a sea, and he drove a dry place through it. It was water, and he put a pathway through it. Now it is a, a desert, it's a dry place, and he's putting water through it. Why is he doing that? Because living in the desert is a very tiresome thing. It's a very strength, stressful life. Uh, and uh, worst of all, we get very, very thirsty. And so that, that's the, the sort of reason why we're here today. We're here to come and drink from the streams that the Lord is putting in the desert for us. Streams of water, streams of life. Uh, we had last week at the uh, Lakeside Conference uh, a new speaker who did the Bible readings. He was David Bracewell, and they were wonderful. He is the vicar of St. Saviour's, St. Saviour's Church in Guildford. Some of you may know him. And he gave a, a, a rather uh, humorous illustration uh, of, 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 of the condition that we're in today, many of us especially many of the clergy. And forgive it if I repeat his language, and he repeated the language of the, the person who spoke in that situation. And, and he said that uh, he went to a deanery meeting. It wasn't his custom to go to a lot of deanery meetings, but he was in this deanery meeting, and um, it came, at the end of uh, some of the business, the, the question was raised about the deanery were to give their views on who was to be the new bishop. Every deanery in the, in the whole diocese were to give their views to the royal dean. And, David said, well, will it make any difference? And the rural dean said, oh, well, he said, I'm going straight away on from here to another meeting where I shall reflect your views. So they began to consider who was the sort of man they wanted, gave various opinions. They felt he wanted a man of real weight and uh, maturity. And um, as they were talking away, finally, somebody said, looking at uh, a rather heavy and mature man sitting to one side who was quietly dozing, uh, <clears throat> they said, you mean what we need is a man like Cyril? Uh, and uh, on speaking that word, Cyril, on hearing his name, Cyril suddenly came to consciousness, blinked, and opened his eyes. He said, um, if you're asking me to do anything, he said, count me out, I'm knackered, he said. <laughs> and, uh, and David was using that to describe the condition of so many of the church leaders today. They're absolutely wiped out. They haven't got a message. They haven't got a vision. They are defeated people. They are hungry. They're thirsty and that they're shepherds and they're lost. God is doing a great thing today. He's doing a new thing. God is always doing a new thing. It's quite a surprise when it comes. It's quite a shock. In fact, the church, the church, and I'm talking about the whole church, is like a, a dying corpse, and uh, uh, God is giving the heart shock treatment, giving it really powerful shock treatment, uh, and it is wonderful to see uh, what is happening as these shock waves uh, pass over the church today. And it's a very exciting time to be in. And that's why we've invited especially Ellie Mumford to come and speak to us tonight. I think it's the first time, not because we've ever thought about it or planned it, but it is actually the first time we've had a, a lady uh, taking the, the ministry on the platform here. And we're very delighted to have Ellie. Will you come up, please? There were others who came from uh, Toronto who brought this blessing uh, before Ellie and uh, in other churches like the New Frontiers 
Terry Vogas, but I think Ellie was the one who really highlighted it for the Anglican Church. And we're just going to pray for you now and just pray that God will just release through you, Ellie, the words that he has for us. Father, I just want to thank you for Ellie. I thank you for the ministry that you've given to her and to her husband. And I just pray, Lord, that tonight she may sense great freedom here and she may sense in a new way your anointing upon her to speak the very words that you have for her to share with us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Can I just say that Ellie and her husband pioneered the first vineyard church here in England, and uh, your husband's the kind of uh, bishop of the whole thing today. He oversees the whole thing over in England, I think. Now, do you like this, or do you prefer the other? Oh, you got that. Oh, that's much better. That's very pucker. Okay, the Lord <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> This is a big place, I had realized. It's a very big place. We've just had some American visitors to stay. In fact, we've had rather a lot of them all at the same time. So as one does at moments of great duress, we decided to go sightseeing. And we did the statutory Tower of London, the Madden to Swords, and the Buckingham Palace railings, and we also went to Westminster <laughs> Abbey. And as we went to the Abbey, one small boy in our party, who is well known to me, dwarfed by the great Gothic arches of the abbey, approached the verger who was on duty, a rather severe, elderly, very tall man in a long black robe. And he went up to him and he looked up at him quite guilelessly and he said, have you heard what's going on in Toronto? <laughs> And he then went on and he told this slightly surprised elderly man, he said, Jesus is pouring out his Holy Spirit. People are laughing and crying and some are even falling over, he said. And the verger, God bless him, looked at this little chap and he said, you know, it is a wonderful thing when Jesus touches our emotions. And I thought, what a great thing in the middle of Westminster Abbey. However, I had a feeling that he was going to offer to pray for the man, so we beat a, <laughs> we beat a hasty retreat, and he returned, I think, with some relief to his Scandinavian tourists. <laughs> but it stuck with me, the phrase, do you know what's happening, he said. And the truth is that there is a stirring in the land. In fact, there's a stirring across the world. But there is a stirring even in our land. And the Holy Spirit of God is being poured out in very great measure from the Hebrides to the home counties, from Dublin to Dorset, from, you could go on and on. These are times of refreshing of which the Bible speaks in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. I think it's true to say, and people who know far better than I are saying, this is not yet revival, but this is a remarkable time of blessing and Jesus is pouring out his Holy Spirit on the church in a way that people of my age and generation have never seen before. There is blessing, there is refreshing, there is renewal, and I have to tell you there is great fun in the church these days. We have in our church um, a slightly older and very um, august lawyer, wonderful man, and he said rather soberly to John the other day, he said, you know, John, we were overdue for a sense of fun. <laughs> and it's true, it really is. And this move of God is all about his mercy and his kindness and his sweetness to the people. There's much laughter and there are many tears and there's great joy reminiscent of the psalmist when he wrote, will you not revive us again, O Lord? that your people may rejoice in you. And much of what is going on, I have to tell you, emanates from a very improbable small church perched on the end of the main runway of Toronto Airport and imaginatively called the Airport Vineyard. And one of the pastors in Toronto, in fact a Baptist pastor, has written this which I found helpful. He says that meetings hosted by the Airport Vineyard in Toronto there has come a notable renewal and revival of hope, of faith, and of expectation. Every single day now, since the 20th of January, 
The Spirit of God has been pouring out freedom and joy and power in the most remarkable ways. Six nights a week, between 350 and 800 people gather for worship, testimony, and ministry. Rededications are numerous, conversions are recently and increasingly being witnessed, and ministry to many thousand pastors and clergy and their spouses has been welcomed by a diverse cross-section of denominational leaders. Now, I came back from Toronto just eight weeks ago this weekend, and at that point, the churches in the immediate area had welcomed 250,000 visitors. And of course, now it's almost double that. We're talking parts of a million of people who have been revived and refreshed and restored and sent on their way rejoicing from this strange little church. With all this, there has come a renewing of commitment and call, an enlarging and a clarification of spiritual vision, and a rekindled passion for Jesus and for the work of the kingdom. Hearing that something was afoot, and never having been slow to go to a party, I went to Toronto. Responsible wife and mother as I am, I left them all and I flew to Toronto. <laughs> and I have to say to you that I have never been on a little holiday, it was only three days, I have never been on a little holiday where more people were more interested in my stories when I got back or less interested in my 97 photographs of the Niagara Falls. <laughs> Nobody could care less. I went with a sense of great excitement and of deep, deep longing. I could even say a sense of bankruptcy in my soul and of a deep, deep longing that it should be otherwise. And what did I find when I got there? 10 minutes from checkout to church, from the airport to the church itself, I found a small concrete building, like a little office block that you would miss if you blinked, run by very, very ordinary people. And as I went into this very small place, I thought to myself in biblical mode, I thought, are not these Galileans? This is all very ordinary. It's very unspectacular. This is an ordinary church, less than, not a piece of stained glass in sight. This was a very ordinary band and very ordinary people. But the place was electric with the presence and with the power of God. I saw and I experienced an outpouring of the Spirit of God that I'd read about in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter two and chapter four. And as I arrived on the first night, with typical generosity, these people said, if you've not been here before, please do come up first and we'd love to pray for you. And I went at a speed to the front, one of the first I was to get there. Because this was a church whose vision statement says, we walk in God's love and we give it away. And when they said to me, what have you come for? I said, I've come for all that you've got. I've come all the way from London and I only have two days. <laughs> and what I, what I didn't say was, it has cost me a great deal of money and I am highly expectant. I saw and experienced remarkable things. I saw phenomena that I had previously only read about. I experienced power such as I couldn't have believed. But I have to tell you, and you must hear me say, that the phenomena and the power are not the primary issue. The primary thing is Jesus. I spent three days among people who were preoccupied with and passionate about Jesus. And they have been in his presence now for days and days on end so that their faces shone with his beauty. And it was so glorious and I wanted to be part of it. One of our um, friends who's a senior pastor of the vineyard in Anaheim went to Toronto. And when he went home, he went up to his study and he prayed and he said, God, why have you been so kind to us? And the Lord said to him, I am doing this so that my church should get excited about my son. And that really is the beginning and the end of it. The Lord is pouring out his spirit upon his people so that we, his bride, should fall in love with Jesus. And so I came home and I scurried back to the scriptures because I had said to myself, I've got to find it in the book. I can only go along with what I find in the book. 
and I began to pore over church history. And I found the most wonderful things, both in the scriptures and in the history books. I read this. The power of God came mightily upon us, insomuch that many cried out for exceeding joy, and many fell to the ground. As soon as we were recovered a little from awe and amazement at the presence of his majesty, we broke out with one voice. We praise thee, O God, we acknowledge thee to be the Lord. And so wrote John Wesley on the 1st of January, 1739, in Fetter Lane, City of London. Nothing that we're seeing is new. Jonathan Edwards, who was a great philosopher, preacher, pastor, and um, centrally involved in a major revival in America during the mid-18th century, he wrote, the apostolic times seem to have returned upon us. Such a display has there been of the power and the grace of the Spirit. Edwards talks about extraordinary affections of fear, sorrow, desire, love, and joy, tears, trembling, groans, loud cries, agonies of the body, and the failing of bodily strength. He said in his account of the revival of religion in Northampton in 1740, he said, it's a very frequent thing to see outcries and faintings, convulsions and such likes, both with distress and also with joy. It was not the manner here, he said, to hold meetings all night, nor was it common to continue them till very late. But it was pretty often so, that there were some so affected and their bodies so overcome that they could not go home, but were obliged to stay all night. <laughs> and then he said, we are ready to own that no man can see God and live. If we see even a small part of the love and the glory of Christ, a foretaste of heaven, is it any wonder that our bodily strength is diminished? And slightly nearer our own time, Spurgeon said, the times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord have at last dawned upon our land. Everywhere there are signs of aroused activity and increased earnestness. And that has to be true in our land and in our day now. Jonathan Edwards had a wonderful wife called Sarah, who among her other preoccupations bore him 11 children. And during the the um, course of the revival in Northampton, the Spirit of God totally felled her for 17 days on end. Not a meal could she prepare. I don't know, nobody says in the books what happened to the children. She was a total mess for 17 days. Every time she tried to get up, she fell down. Every time they put her in a chair, she fell out of it. And one day she, was, um, she got up or tried to in the morning and dressed herself in all the things that 18th century women did. And she then went down because her husband had a guest. And she thought the least she could do would be to make the lunch. So she went down and as she passed the study door, he was talking, speaking the name of Jesus and she just crashed to the ground and they took her back to bed and nobody says who made the lunch. And this went on for 17 days. And at the end of it, she said, I had a delightful sense of the immediate presence of God, of his nearness to me, and of my dearness to him. And I do believe, and from all that I've seen in the last few weeks and the people that I've prayed for, over and over again, we are waking up to the nearness of God to us and of our incredible dearness to him. And I could give you list upon list of illustrations and stories and could keep you here all night. But in fact, there were wonderful things that I saw both that side of the Atlantic and during the course of the last eight weeks over here as well. As David was saying just now, I saw dozens of pastors who came to Toronto exhausted and beaten up. And I must tell you their wives even more so. And I saw them refreshed and restored and given a passion for Jesus that sent them on their way rejoicing and re-energized. There was a young um, youth pastor who arrived in town because his wife told him that he was getting far too serious and far too straight and that to have any effect on young people, he needed to loosen up a bit. And so she packed him off to Toronto. And he arrived the same night that I did. And they prayed for him and he fell to the ground and he laughed like I've never seen anyone laugh. I feared for his heart. It was just, but it was such fun to see. 
And it really was like medicine to the soul. It says in Proverbs that laughter and a cheerful heart is good medicine. And this man gave his testimony the next night, and he spoke of the restoration that had come to his heart as the Lord loosened him with his laughter. There was a very serious and rather intense young pastor who came and watched all that was going on for days on end, seemingly quite unaffected. I mean, thrilled, but unaffected. And then one night, the Spirit of God fell on him, and he started to shake and rattle and roll and do all the things that don't honestly matter, but he did do them. And his wife hadn't been able to sleep in the same bed as him for days and nights on end. He couldn't stop twitching and shaking. And in the end, he decided the only thing to do was to get a grip and to go down to his church office and to type out the pew bulletin, what do you call it, a bulletin or the newsletter or the pew, whatever you put in on a Sunday. We don't have pews and I've lost my touch a bit. However, he went to type and as he did so, he wrote out the name of a seminar that was coming that week and it was called Come Holy Spirit. And as he typed out the letters, the Spirit of God <laughs> fell on him <laughs> with such power that the man had to give the work to somebody else. In Toronto, people were going to meetings and leaving them and telephoning their friends and leading them to Christ over the phone. They were going out of the meetings and into restaurants and talking with people with uncharacteristic boldness and effectiveness. There was one young woman who had been to um, a meeting for a couple of hours and then went to a restaurant. And as she was eating, she looked across the table and she saw a complete family eating their evening meal together. And she was a very shy girl and she went straight up to them and she said to them all, do you want to be saved? And every one of them said yes. And she led them all to Christ there on the spot. There was another young man who went to a restaurant and a chap was sitting near him and he said, um, are you a Christian? And the man said, yes, yes, he was, he had to admit it. And he said, um, it turned out that this young man had lost his job, he'd lost his wife and his home. He was on the verge of suicide. And the man led him to Christ and saved his life. And a life that five minutes before had been destined for hell was set on its way for heaven. Wonderful things are happening in the wake of the outpouring of the Spirit of God in these meetings. The school children in Toronto are being sent home for shaking. <laughs> and some of their parents have been sent medical notes saying that they are not to return to school again until they have a note to say that they are not epileptic. <laughs> and we heard slightly more recently of friends of ours who have a vineyard church in San Diego. And a young woman had been to church and had been gloriously blessed by God that night and had laughed and laughed and laughed and then ill-advisedly got into her car to drive home. <laughs> and as she drove home, um, she saw this blue flashing light in the rear view mirror and it was a traffic cop and he pulled her over and he said, Madam, I have reason to believe that you're drunk. And she said, well, I sort of am. So he made her take a breathalyzer test and of course it was negative. And as she took the test, she just fell to the ground laughing. <laughs> That's a new one to try. And as she fell to the ground, so did the policeman. <laughs> and he said to her, what is happening here? So she told him, and he said, how do you get to know this Jesus? So she led him to Christ on the bonnet of the car, and, he, <laughs> and he's now a member of the church. Wonderful stories. There was a woman in Toronto, I was only at the church two nights, and on one night there was a young woman there who had actually become a Christian at a women's breakfast at our church, which always makes one feel good. And there she was, the other side of the world, but I have to tell you, she'd totally given up. She'd been a Christian for about a year, and she'd moved to Toronto and got a new job, and she'd given up. And she'd somehow heard that I was going to be visiting, and she got to the church, and the Lord restored her wonderfully to himself. So much so that in the small hours of the morning, she found our hotel and she rang us up in the middle of the night and said, what must I do to be baptized? And she's now, I've just heard, full of the Lord and indeed going to be baptized. Wonderful stories of restoration. Another person whom we um, know of who had been extremely ill with a horrible um, colitis condition. She was newly married, she was infertile, and she had a history of horrendous abuse as a child. And prior to all this, at the end of last year, the colitis was gloriously healed. And then for two hours, she lay on the floor, and who knows what goes on? Who knows what goes on when God does these things? 
but at the end of two hours she got to her feet and she said, it is as if I had never had a past. There is no abuse, there is no memory, and she is now well on her way towards her first child. God is doing wonderful, wonderful things in the lives of his people. And one story very recently from Toronto which really melted my heart was of a young woman who'd gone to a service there, and the pastor will invite people to come up after the worship to tell of the things that God's doing in their lives. And sensitively enough, he will always pre-warn people and say, would you be happy if I came and asked you to do this? But on this occasion, he saw a young woman, and the Lord was powerfully on her, and she was shaking away, and he just pulled her out, and he said, would you come and talk with us? And she said, yes, she would. So she came up, and he said to her, I've not seen you here before. Have you been before? And she said, no. And he said, um, do you come from the area? And she said, yes. He said, have friends brought you here? And she said, yes. And he said, well, do you go to any other church? She said, no. And he said, well, why not? Because, and she said, because I'm not a Christian. And he hesitated, and she just looked at him, and she said, I'm a Jewess. And he took her head in his hands, and he looked at her in the eye, and he said, this is your Messiah. And she came to Christ there and then in front of the whole assembly and came back to the church every night thereafter to meet her new Messiah. The Lord is coming for rich and poor, for lost and found, for Jew and Gentile, all over the place. It's a wonderful thing. And just in the course of the last eight weeks, in churches throughout London, which is as far as I've been able to visit, fabulous things have been happening in the most improbable places. I went to an Anglican church in near Westminster, and the police were called because nobody had ever heard so much noise and so much merriment coming from a church. <laughs> and during the course of the evening, a tramp walked into the back of the church. He was living on the street. He was drinking petrol and meths. He was an ex-Irish Guards Sergeant Major. He'd been to the church a few days before because he'd heard of a party. And then he came the night that we were there, and the Lord felled him by the power of his Holy Spirit, and he came to Christ gloriously on the floor. And the next night he came to the church prayer meeting, and to celebrate, he had been out and had his hair cut, he was washed, he was sober, and he had bought a suit. And he stood at the prayer meeting and he said, Jesus has saved my life. Amen. Is this not what we want? <laughs> Wonderful thing. And at the end of the same meeting, as we invited the Spirit of God to come, a young man literally went ballistic. He shot into the air and started shrieking. And I thought, oh my gosh, he's messing up the meeting. <laughs> it was slightly excessive. It was a very echoey Anglican church. And I thought to myself, this is a little over the top, I thought. <laughs> and at the, he shrieked and he bounced around. I mean, very athletic. I thought, how did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I knew. However, he came up to me at the end. He was about 18 and he was frightfully apologetic and very sweet and most embarrassed. He said, I'm sorry. And you know, I said, that's fine. It's fine, lovely. I enjoyed it. <laughs> 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 But he had been a Muslim and had recently found Christ. And as we spoke, and as the Holy Spirit of God ministered, the freedom of Jesus impacted his heart and sent him just into orbit. And I thought to myself, oh, with God, I'm so sorry, I must never judge again. <laughs> I heard of another man, there was a church, another church that I visited, and a young man was interviewed during the course of the evening, and he'd been to a meeting the night before, he was a student, so he hadn't had to go to work the next day, and he'd spent the whole day under the power of God to such effect that his friends could only get him back to the meeting that evening in a Sainsbury's shopping trolley. <laughs> Another church in the middle of London. A young man visiting from America had flown in that morning, arrived at church that night with his friends, and as I was speaking about Jesus coming for his bride, he got saved. At that very phrase, I said, Jesus is coming to the church. He's coming for his bride. And the young man got saved on the spot. 
And he came to talk to me afterwards, and he said, may I pray for you? It was so moving. Another young man at the same meeting, we went to, um, to pray for him, and uh, Sandy Miller, in fact, said to him, do tell me how long have you been a Christian, the sort of thing you say to people when you don't know them. And he looked at his watch, and he said, 17 minutes. <laughs> There was another child at the same meeting, a child of 11. And one of our teams said to him, would you like us to pray for you? And he said, yes. And she said, what can I pray? And he said that he wanted to know about Jesus and how could he have his sins forgiven? So she led him to Christ. She pray laid her hands on him. He fell to the ground. He was filled with the spirit. And he lay on the ground for half an hour, 11 year old child meeting his savior. Wonderful things in another church we were ministering at. A young Iraqi student came in off the street. He was dared, I think. A whole bunch of them were outside, and one of them came in, and I think it was a dare. And he sauntered, swaggered in to see what was going on. And we, friends of ours, scooped him up and brought him forward, and we prayed for him. And he just said, is this how church always is? <laughs> and we said, well, more and more. And for our own church and our own people, we are seeing wonderful things. We're seeing repentance as we haven't before. We're seeing deep reconciliation. Someone rang me the other morning and said, God has healed my heart towards so-and-so. And these two had been in very bad shape together for three years. We have seen physical healing. We have seen a child who has 50% impaired deafness totally healed. I heard of another healing just yesterday of an old lady whose insomnia had been healed, which is a big deal for an elderly lady. Infertile women are becoming pregnant. Broken marriages are being restored. We know of at least four couples in our church whose marriages have been restored. One woman who has completely fallen in love with her husband and eight weeks ago was planning to divorce him. We've had people who we've prayed with for whom the shame of divorce has been removed. We've had a young woman who says, reading the scriptures has come alive to me, and it's as if Jesus, I hear Jesus' voice reading to me from the book of Acts. Another young woman who came and said, I feel completely different. I've waited all my life for this. She's talking to her friends constantly and effortlessly about Jesus. Service after service, we're seeing a succession of godly, upright, sensible people being carried out of church, totally not upright and thoroughly insensible. <laughs> and as I said to my friendly plumber the other day, you can call us weird, but you can never again call us boring. <laughs> and he could not get out of the house fast enough. <laughs> and so you say, what are the perceived results so far? Let me just list them for you quickly. These are the things that I've seen in myself over the course of the last few weeks. A love for Jesus greater than ever before. This thing, whatever it is, is all about Jesus. This is about a preoccupation with and a passion for Jesus like never before. This is our Jesus coming to his church, coming to his bride. I found in myself a passion for the kingdom of God more than I ever knew so that with fervor I can pray, thy kingdom come, O God, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I found scripture to be exciting and true, and all the bits that one sort of embarrassedly skipped over suddenly are so wonderful and so real. I have a heightened sense of church history, which has always been something that I've loved. And you look back at Erasmus and some of these dusty old chaps, and they've been doing this long, long since. Teresa of Avila, now there's a wild woman. Catholic mystics who've been writing these things and we've been passing them by. Jonathan Edwards, Wesley in the Whitfields, Spurgeon, and I read only yesterday of Billy Graham saying that in the last few months he'd seen more people come to Christ than ever before. I have in myself an awareness that these are the most glorious days in which to be alive. And the honest truth is I wouldn't be anybody else of any other age, living at any other time, or in any other place than me, aged dot, 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 living in London now. These are fabulous, fabulous days, and I wouldn't exchange it for anything. God has privileged us to be alive in these days when he has chosen to pour his spirit out on his people. I find an ease in talking about Jesus. 
I went and talked with a mother of a school friend, one of the children, sitting in her garden, talking under the apple tree. Non-Christian spirit of God fell on her as we talked. Goosebumps, shivering, shaking. What's happening to me, she said. God, said I. And suddenly we talked. It was wonderful. And I drove away and I thought, that was evangelism and it didn't even hurt. <laughs> I went to the dentist, and the dentist, you know, they tried to be so sweet and say nice things, and he said to me, well, I expect things quieten down a bit in your church around the summer. <laughs> Silly man. <laughs> well, I said, no, that's not quite true. I can see how you might think so, but let me tell you what is happening in our church. A captive audience, dentist, nurse, one side, all these things. It was wonderful telling him about Jesus. I've noticed in myself a love for the whole church like I would not have believed possible. And I need to say that this has been growing in my heart for the last probably 10 years, a deep love for every part of the body of Christ, every expression of the church, whether they handle snakes or whether they don't, I will love them. And I really find that I do. And I know that God said in the Psalms that it was a blessed thing to him when brethren would dwell together in unity, for there he would command a blessing. And I believe God is commanding blessing on the church in our day that we've not seen before. This is not, this move of the Spirit of God is not about the vineyard, it's all about the kingdom. It's not about any one denomination, it's all about the church. I've found in myself in the last little while a love for and a longing for and a desire to prefer and to bless the Catholic Church as I wouldn't have believed and when I was a very, very little girl, my mother taught me to love the Catholics. She used to say to me, were it not for them, we would have no faith. Had they not preserved the faith for the, through the darkest ages of history, we would have nothing to celebrate. All the great reformers were Catholics. And I have within me this passion to see them all join in. We're seeing Catholics coming to our services, getting blessed, getting prayed for. One young man, great friend of ours, who's a Catholic and lives in a wonderful community, came to our church recently, asked if he could. We said, please come. Please, let's get our hands on you, we said to him. <laughs> <coughs> I mean, let's pray for you, brother. So we prayed for him, and the power of God came so greatly upon him that he could not physically contain it. So he just ran round the grounds outside the church, round and round and round and round until he finally fell because he couldn't contain the power of the living God in his life. We long to see every church join together in this thing. We're finding fellowship with leaders across the churches in the most wonderful way. We went to a dinner party the other night and there were just a few of us and we were from representing different, not just different churches, different streams of churches in this country. And we held hands and we prayed for one another as if our hearts would break. And it must please God it must please Jesus who's coming for his bride. I discovered the joy of the Lord, and I met a friend this afternoon who said to me, it's a funny thing that the Church of England has been praying now for 400 years that God would make his chosen people joyful. And at last, they seem surprised that he actually has. A pastor in Toronto said, with great perspicacity, he said, I didn't know that God could be this much fun. And certainly we are finding in Putney that there's much more fun in the church than there is down at the Slug and Lettuce. And people are coming to church now because it is great fun. Two other things I've noticed in myself, an appetite for ministry. You know, for ye I've loved ministering to people, which is why I do what I do. I've always loved it. But I had become really weary in well-doing, really weary. And now God has given me an appetite to minister to people that is just, what's the word, insatiable. I can't get to enough people fast enough to give this thing away. There is a new energy, a new excitement, a new longing to stay late, a new longing not to go to bed so that we can pray for a few more. I prayed very, as soon as I came home from Toronto with the recklessness of the new competent, I prayed for a friend in the street, in the market, street market in, um, in Battersea. The Spirit of God fell on her. I mean, if the fruit stall hadn't been there, she'd have been on the street. Wonderful. I thought, this is such fun, even in the street. We went to a wedding, and we prayed for some of the guests at the wedding, and that, I mean, that was really wonderful. Hats are... <laughs> 
All these hats were askew, and it was just terrific. And I'm also discovering that this is remarkably and mysteriously contagious. What God is doing today is like measles from which there is no recovery. And I told you at the beginning that the airport vineyard says that their, their whole reason for being is to walk in God's love and to give it away. And I'm finding that this, and all the other people that I've talked to in the last few weeks are finding that this is fantastically transferable, wonderfully contagious. And one of the pastors that I met in Canada said, and I quote, not my words, he said, get a bunch of people of faith together. Get a bunch of people of faith together and ask the Spirit of God to fall upon you which may not be great grammar, but it is a glorious truth. So shall we do that? Would that be appropriate? Why don't you stand? As I was um, preparing to talk with you this week, I felt the Lord just said this terribly simply to me. And I felt he said, my purpose is to refresh and my pleasure is to bless. And I think that's the whole reason we're here, that his purpose is to refresh his people, many of whom have become weary in well-doing, and that it's his pleasure to bless us. There's much pleasure in this joy of the Father, the love of God for his people, the passion of the bridegroom for the bride. So Father, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for your presence in the church in our day. And God, I ask you now to come and to pour your spirit out upon your people, to revive us again, O oh God, that we may rejoice in you. Father, we ask that you would loose upon us your precious, life-giving, refreshing Holy Spirit, that we, your people, may fall more passionately in love with Jesus and with his kingdom and his purposes. And God, we invite you now to come and to do whatever you would like to do with your people. Lord, send your spirit upon us. Make your chosen people joyful, God. Bless your church. Meet with us, Jesus. And you need to remember <laughs> that all the funniest things might happen around you and nothing might seem to happen to you, and that's fine. What matters is you and your Jesus. So you focus on him and you wait for him and you allow yourself to bask in the sunshine of his love, whatever form his touch on you may take. Because the phenomena bit doesn't matter as much as engaging your soul with your Jesus.
is breaking coming now. The Lord is just setting the captives free. It's like a freedom. It's coming to you like in your tummy. It's like a, the Lord's just saying, free, 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 free. Lord, increase the anointing, Lord. Increase the anointing. Let the fire come. Yes, Let it come. Yes, God. Thank you, Lord. Shun. Right up to the back, Lord. 